Hello, everybody. I'm Ed Robinson, and welcome to another exciting edition of the League Wraparound. This is the program that gets you caught up on anything and everything happening around the NFL. We have a jam-packed show for you. We're going to preview the Super Wild Card Weekend playoff games. Hey, the NFL second season is in full swing. Thank you so much for tuning into the program. So let's get to it. My top three storylines. My first storyline is going to be Pete Carroll. Yes, it is true. Pete Carroll has been fired by the Seattle Seahawks. 14 great seasons in Seattle. I mean, Pete, track record, went to two Super Bowls, won a Super Bowl. That was the Super Bowl that was played at MetLife Stadium in the New York, New Jersey area where that defense and the running game, uh, Legion of Boom, Marshawn Lynch, Russell Wilson was only in his second year in the league. The Seahawks, that team came in and did damage on Peyton Manning and the Denver Broncos. And, of course, we know about what happened the following year. They returned to the Super Bowl. We know how that turned out with the whole debacle, not giving Lynch the ball at the goal line. Russell throws the interception. But anyway, that was a classic Super Bowl when the Seahawks took on Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. So it is official. The Seattle Seahawks have fired head coach Pete Carroll after 14 seasons. And listen, before Pete got to Seattle, his track record in college was phenomenal. He was the head coach at USC. Won a couple of national championships, including winning four Rose Bowls, two Orange Bowls. Also was a seven-time Pac-10 champion. And then winds up joining the Seattle Seahawks, where not only was he the head coach, but also the vice president of football operations. He'll still serve in an advisory role despite not being the head coach anymore. And this was very interesting because when he did the press conference, It didn't sound like a gentleman that, according to reports, said that it was an amicable split. It Pete sounded like he could still go out and coach. He wasn't ready to leave by any means. And rightfully so. I believe him. I mean, hey, this is one of the most energetic gentlemen, not just in the NFL, but really one of the most energetic coaches, one of the most energetic personalities we've seen in quite some time. And I know Pete has already said that he has no plans to slow down anytime soon. He wants to continue coaching. He wants to continue to make a difference and he feels that he can still do it. And I believe he can still do it too. I know we're in the modern era of the NFL where it's a quarterback's era where quarterbacks, a lot of organizations are looking for offensive minded head coach who are looking for offensive minded head coaches, excuse me. But one thing is for sure, Pete can still do it. I know Pete is a defensive guy, but Hey, He still can coach. He still has what it takes. And I believe him. He still has the juice. His career head coaching record during the regular season, 170 wins, 120 losses, and one tie. Postseason record, 11 and 11. So again, that's consistent right there. Now, the Seahawks went to the playoffs last year. They fell short in the wild card game to the San Francisco 49ers, but Again, when I think of Pete Carroll, his legacy in Seattle as far as a head coach is concerned, again, the Legion of Boom defense, also Russell Wilson being developed, Marshawn Lynch, beast mode. Also, there were some things that had happened during his time in Seattle where there were reports about him protecting Russell from other members of the team and then Russell wanting him out. So it's a rumor mill going on with that. But listen, He was the head coach there for 14 seasons. That's a long time. And wherever Pete ends up, I know Pete has an advisory role with the Seahawks, but we'll see what happens. It's amazing that Pete Carroll, he's under some very illustrious company. He is one of four head coaches to have won won a college football national championship and an NFL championship. The others are Paul Brown, Jimmy Johnson, and Barry Switzer. So, Pete, again, one of the most energetic coaches, not just in the NFL, but really in all of football. And I'll tell you one thing. Yeah, he'll serve as an ad- in his advisory role for the Seahawks, but I think it could be a short-lived position because there's a lot of positions that have opened up or are going to be beginning to open up. And I'll get more into that a little bit later. But Pete Carroll fired as the head coach of the Seattle Seahawks. My next storyline is going to be Bill Belichick. You talk about a fall from grace 
when I think of Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots, I think, of course, not only with Bill, but with Tom Brady, Rob Gronkowski, Julian Edelman, all of the great Patriot championship teams that they had. Belichick, head coach as the New England Patriots, eight-time Super Bowl winner. He's been a multiple league coach of the year award winner. I mean, the man has put up a track record. Not only has he put up a track record as the head coach of the Patriots, but even before then had success as a head coach of the Cleveland Browns. And then, of course, his great time with the New York Giants being a part of the Bill Belichick coaching tree. This year was a disappointing year for the New England Patriots. Did not make the playoffs. They lost in the final week of the regular season to the New York Jets. And there's a lot of questions swirling around Foxborough. Could this be Bill's last hurrah in New England? He's made comments during the week saying that he's open for changes. He's open for change in the organization. And this is going to be interesting because when we talk about coach, general manager slash owner relationships, Robert Kraft and Bill Belichick have had one of the best, if not the best in the NFL for quite some time. Robert Kraft has not made a coaching change in 24 seasons. And that says a lot about not just Bill Belichick, but, but the Patriots as a whole. Yes, they've had Tom Brady for the majority of those years, but just also the talent that has come along, like a Julian Edelman and a Rob Gronkowski and a Randy Moss and a Ted Bruce, uh, a Teddy Bruschi, Ted Johnson, Richard Seymour, Rodney Harrison, Ty Law, Lawyer Malloy, just to name a few. So whatever's going to go on between now and maybe up until the big game, all eyes are going to be fixated on Foxborough. All, all eyes were really focused on Foxborough since last year. We saw New England the last two years not developing at the quarterback position since Brady leaving. They thought Mac Jones was the one. Not the case. Let's see what happens in the draft in April. We have to see first what's going to happen with the Belichick situation. But, man, if this is the end, it's been one heck of a ride. It has been one heck of a ride with Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots. But, hey, again, Coach Belichick, he says he's willing to make changes. He's willing to adapt to changes. We'll see. We'll see. But, man, twenty. it's been... 24 seasons since Robert Kraft has made a coaching change, if that does happen, if Coach Belichick is let go or is not returned or could be maybe a Pete Carroll situation, we'll have to see. But, man, if this is the end, man, it's definitely been one heck of a ride. And for my last storyline is going to be head coaching firings. So Arthur Smith was let go by the Atlanta Falcons after three seasons with the team. No playoff appearances during his time with the team. He finished with a record of 21 wins and 30 losses. Also, Ron Rivera, after four seasons with the Washington Commanders, he was relieved from his duties as head coach of the Washington Commanders during his time with the team. He had a record of 26-40-1, 26 wins, 40 losses, and one tie. And he had one playoff appearance and no playoff wins. And the surprising one to me was a Mike Vrabel. After six seasons as the head coach of the Tennessee Titans, he was fired. During his time with the team, he had a record of 54 and 45. 54 wins, 45 losses, two AFC South division titles, three playoff playoff appearances. I'm a little bit confused about this Vrabel one. I really thought... I think they were going to bring him back for maybe another year or two. This one is, um, I'm very confused about this one. And, um, and of course, I mentioned earlier about Pete Carroll being fired by the Seattle Seahawks. Vrabel and Carroll, they won't be without a job much long. Depending on what happens with the whole Belichick situation in New England, Vrabel is definitely going to be a candidate. I know Gerard Mayo, who is also a former Patriot, who is currently one of Bill Belichick's assistant assistants, excuse me, he could get a mentioning as well if Belichick is relieved from his duties. But the Vrabel one, a little bit confused on that one. Arthur Smith, I knew that was going to come. If not at the end of the year, I thought next year was going to be, you know, 
the the year that he could be on the hot seat. I thought they were going to bring him back at least one more year because with Desmond Ritter coming in and, you know, we'll see, you know, with the quarterback situation. But again, as they say, uh, the worst the worst day for an NFL head coach is the day after the final week of the regular season, as they call it, Black Monday. And this is when a lot of coaches know that their jobs are on the line. Either they're going to be let go at the end of the year, or they're going to have one more year, maybe two years to get it right. And the NFL is a doggy dog business, and you just never know. I, I did not expect Mike Vrabel to be fired by the Tennessee Titans. I thought they would have brought him back another year, maybe two years, maybe to try to get the Will Levis situation together. But man, this is a tough all around, especially with the Pete Carroll thing, not just with Mike Vrabel, but Pete Carroll. This is definitely a surprise right here. Ron Rivera. I knew this was coming. Eric B could be in line to be the next head coach of the commanders. We'll see what happens with that. Jim Harbaugh after winning the national championship, with Michigan, the Chargers job, the Commanders job is available. Now you got Tennessee, you got Atlanta and the Seattle job available. Also the Raiders job as well as Carolina is available as well. So this is going to be interesting, but man, never a dull moment in the NFL and we definitely have our head coaching firings already in place. Pick to Montgomery. Wide open LaPorta. Easy touchdown for the Lions. The key guy is a receiver here. Here's a toss. Here's Gibbs. Here's the corner and a touchdown. There goes Skipper in motion. It's Montgomery. It is the Lions touchdown. Career high 13th of the year for Montgomery. Big to Jameer Gibbs. Deep throw from Goff. Down the sideline, Sam Brown. Almond Ross, Sam Brown in a foot race. Eyes on the end zone. Cuts it back. St. Brown is all the way. Touchdown, Detroit. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the program. That audio was courtesy of the National Football League, the Detroit Lions, and Fox Sports. The Detroit Lions beat the Minnesota Vikings in Week 18 of the 2023-2024 NFL regular season. Jared Goff connected with some of his best targets all year long. Sam Laporta, also Amon Ross St. Brown, and you heard also Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery getting a couple of touchdowns. Well, it's, hey, it's been great all year long in the Motor City, and the Lions are getting ready for a big wild card playoff game against a very familiar person that they're going to be going up against the Los Angeles Rams. To talk more about that matchup and other things, let's welcome her back to the program. She is the Director of Writer Management for Our Turf Football. Of course, it's a website that covers the NFL. And what she does as a Director of Writer Management, she covers the NFC North, specifically her beloved Detroit Lions. Let's welcome her back to the program, Sonia Greenfield. Sonia, welcome back to the program. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Ed. Thank you so much for having me back on and making it work. I really appreciate it, and I'm excited to talk about my Lions. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know you are. And, again, thank you so much once again, as always, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us on the program. So before we get into the big playoff game coming up with the Lions going up against the Rams, let's go back to the final week of the regular season, week 18 to be exact. So Detroit – beat their division rival, Minnesota Vikings, 30-20. to 20. Unfortunately, it came at a huge cost. Sam Laporta, the all-rookie tight end, he got hurt in this contest. Also, Amon Ra was shaken up in this game as well. What were your takeaways from this uh, victory with the Lions over the Vikings uh, besides the injuries? Um, outside of the injuries, it was just another good win, um, a bounce back after the whole Dallas fiasco. I think that that um, really was just a good statement win, um, and I was just proud of the team coming back and putting, you know, putting what happened in Dallas 
to their best, better interest, I guess, is what you could say, um, because they kind of use that already as motivation to kind of, you know, go out there and still say that it is still Detroit versus everybody and, um, you know, just put on not a show, but just, you know, take it to the Vikings. And it came at an expense, I think, obviously, Sam Laporta and Amon Ross St. Brown, but um, I'm more concerned about Sam Laporta, but either way, they got the win, and um, that's really what you wanted is the win. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. That's all that matters is the win. And when you get the win, you're in the playoffs, and they handle their business, and it's a done deal. So now let's just kind of talk briefly about the Lions' victory over the Vikings. The running game, they both running backs got touchdowns. They didn't get a lot in the yardage department, but they made their pre- their presence was felt in this contest. David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs, they both scored touchdowns in this game. Give me your thoughts on David and Jameer's play in this one. Um, I really liked what they did um, and just you know, ground and pound kind of thing. Like you said, not a lot of yardage, but at least enough to let them know that the run game is still something to be um, respected. And that's one thing, you know, I've talked about it plenty of times, and I'm really glad that we have Jameer and David Montgomery because, you know, the run game has not been um, respectable in Detroit, let's just put it out there, for the past few years, Um, or, you know, historically, I should say. And since we've had Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery, it's been – a much needed pick up to the offense and I think that you know having those guys out there was just really good for the team um getting some good looks and some good touches and you know they were able to make it happen and be a very good complement to the game and you know just having that running back ability that they have just <laughs> sounds kind of weird, but just having that ability, I think, um, just really brings that added dimension to the Lions team, which was very much so needed, I think. All right, and, you know, so we move along now to the passing game for a moment. We had um, Khalif Raymond and Josh Reynolds were very effective in this game, as well as Donovan Peoples-Jones. Give me your thoughts on those three gentlemen's receivers in this game. Um, again, they put on a very good show. Um, they um, really, I think, worked together with Goff well to kind of um, make the Lions go. And I really like um, Donovan Peoples-Jones, you know, a midseason ad and has already really kind of made himself comfortable in the offense, in the role that he's playing. And that, I think, has been a much-needed um, – not – I wouldn't – a much-needed boost to the offense. Not that they needed that much of a boost, but I think just giving them one extra person to go to and just be somebody to be accounted for. And in this league, you can't have enough too many, or you can't have enough offensive weapons. And so there you go. And I think that addition of DPJ has been really good for the Lions. All right, I want to talk now just about the defense for a moment. Alex Anzalone was the team's leading tackler with eight tackles, and he has been a monster all over the field all season long for Detroit. Give me your thoughts on Alex's play in this game. Um, I think his play, again, was showing why he is stepping up as to be one of Detroit's um, leading defenders. And I just like what he does on the field and just brings that extra, you know, bit of energy to the team. And I like what he's done. Um, you know, he really just has, like, a an eye for just getting after people and, you know, ma- making those extra plays. And so I really like what he's done this season. And it, I think he's really stepped up this year. And this game was another example of him doing just that. So he's been one of my favorite defensive players this year. And I think that he has, um, he is another good reason why the Lions are in the position that he's in, that they're in. All right, and then speaking of uh, somebody that's been in a good position this year, also on the defensive side, Jack Campbell. Jack had seven tackles, and he recorded a sack in this game. Just give me your thoughts on Jack's play against the Vikings. I like that, too. I like like him a lot. He has been um, just, you know, a really good – 
oh, my words are not coming out my right. A really good embodiment of the Detroit grit. And I like what he did this game and just really, you know, getting after people, um, the quarterback especially, um, just really making his – his presence felt on the field. And in the NFC North, that's one thing that, you know, the quarterback play I think was a little bit down this year, especially for the Vikings because they were one team that kind of always kind of not scares me, but I always want to keep my eye on them. And I think um, Campbell really was a good reason why that, you know, he was able to kind of make that, that feeling go away because he was just out there and, you know, making his presence felt. So I really like to play this game, especially. All right. Uh, another person that was an impact player, and that's Levi on He recorded a sack in this game. Give me your thoughts on Levi in this play. Um, I like it when newer kids come out, <laughs> although he's not truly a kid, but <laughs> when newer kids come out and just, you know, again, make their presence felt. And I think Campbell, Dan Campbell has really allowed for that um, to kind of, that, that culture and that atmosphere to come out. And so he was a really good player and just watching his energy and just wanting to be a part of things. And I think that just really made a difference during this game. All right, a couple of players made some key interceptions in this game. Cameron Sutton and, of course, C.J. Gardner-Johnson. You know what, what type of stuff C.J. is made out of. Give me your thoughts on their play in this game. C.J. Um, has been, uh, you know, a good player this season. He's had a couple of issues here and there, but overall he has been a real game changer and a real motivated kind of player, and I love some good defensive, secondary-type play, and that's what he has done. Cam Sutton has done that as well. And so this team's secondary has really come alive, I think, this year. And, I mean, this team really just has come alive this year, but the secondary especially has really made their presence known um, from game one till this past game. So I really have liked the play of CJ and Sutton. been very good. You know, somebody that has just been a monster all season long is Aiden Hutchinson. He's only been in the league. He's only been in the NFL for two seasons. Now, we talk about defensive player of the year candidates and T.J. Watt. T.J. Watt is the top candidate for the league defensive player of the year. But Aiden Hutchinson, he's definitely going to get some strong consideration as well. He had two sacks in the win against the Vikings. Give me your thoughts on Aiden's play. Aiden has been, you know, very consistent. He has improved every game, and, you know, he's improved since last season, too. And, you know, I think he will definitely get some considerations for Defensive Player of the Year, um, especially in this game, and just how he plays with such energy and intensity and such a high motor. And, you know, that's just what he does. That's who he is, and he showed it again against the Vikings. Um, you know, I think one day when TJ isn't as, you know, prominent in the DPOI, I think it is definitely going to go a couple times to Aiden Hutchinson because I see him as, you know, just one of those great defensive players. And I'm glad that he's on my team. <laughs> Yeah, I know that's right. It's always a blessing to have Aiden on your team, man, just how dominant he is. And I want to get back to the receiving side for a moment. Amon Ra St. Brown, look sure. at, listen, Amon Ra has been a monster this year. He had seven catches for 144 yards and a touchdown in the win over the Vikings. We know that Amon Ra suffered an injury, but give me your thoughts on Amon Ra's play again, the win against the Vikings and his health coming into the playoff game against the Rams. Um, he was, you know, just a little dinged up, I think. I don't think it was, well, I don't think it was as bad as it could have been, number one. Um, and if it is as bad as, you know, it could have been, then um, he'll still probably get out there because I can see him as the type of player that's going to want to be out there and, um, you know, put it, leave it all on the field and give his all to his team. Um, he has done such good things this year. He has been um, yak king. Yards after catch king this year, and, you know, you love to see it. He has just been just a godsend in a way and just really improving the receiver core on this team and the leader of the receiver core this year. And he had another stellar game against the Vikings and just put up some amazing numbers. And, you know, you love to see it and another guy that you're glad to have on your team. And he has just been 
very dominant this year, and I love having him. Yeah, he's really been uh, – we've talked about him the last couple of years, but this is the year where him and Jared have really put things together, and we're really starting yeah. to see – that duo come into full form. It's, it's very refreshing to see. And um, Sam Laporta, I mean, hey, we talk about the Rookie of the Year candidates. I mean, C.J. Stroud most likely is going to be the overwhelming favorite to win this year's Rookie of the Year. But Sam Laporta definitely deserves some strong consideration as well. Give me your thoughts on his play and also his status for coming into the playoff game against the Rams. Um, my thoughts on his play is that he has been such a great tight end. And, you know, after Hawkinson left, you're like, eh, I don't know. Hawkinson was really, really good. But, um, okay, maybe not really, really. But Hawkinson was definitely very good and a much um, liked addition to the team. And so Sam Laporta kind of had some big shoes to fill, and he did that and more, I think, and has just had a phenomenal season. And, again, to the Vikings has been no different. So I think that he has just been, you know, really good and definitely strong consideration for Rookie of the Year, which I totally agree will go to C.J. Stroud because that kid has been amazing too. But Sam Laporta has been just, I think, just really great, really great. Obviously not to C.J.'s level, but definitely very good and um wonderful addition to the team. Now, in terms of his injury, they feel like he's going to be able to play, and I know he's going to want to play. Um, and so I just looked at a couple things just to see where we are, and it sounds like they are leaning towards having him play but um, are going to take it very, very slow because if they are fortunate enough to win the game, you know, they are going to want him for a longer run. So if they, it looks like they're going to win, then they'll probably, you know, either maybe sit him a little bit more if they can or just be a little bit more, um, not gentle, but just, you know, a little bit more, um, best way I can put it. <laughs> yeah, they have to be very careful because you have to remember this is one playoff game. There's not going to be another week. You win, you move on. You win, you go. You, you lose, you go home, and it's just that simple. And they're definitely going to have to watch him carefully, but they're going to need him for this game against the L.A. Rams. Uh, Jared Goff, listen, mm-hmm. Jared, Jared was Jared. Another solid year, big improvements from the last two years, and he passed for over 300 yards in the victory over the Vikings. Give me your thoughts on Jared's play in the win. Um, Jared has been such a good player for us, and he's, you know, occasionally he has made some bad decisions, which, you know, has has been kind of his M.O., but overall, he has gained respect and trust of Dan Campbell and of this team, and I think that that's showing in his play, and you see that, you know, throwing for over 300 yards, having a good, um, good chemistry with his receivers and running backs, I think, has been just amazing, and you know, even though as good as he's been, I think he also has um, the offensive line to thank as well because they've kept him upright. He's been sacked some, but not as much as, you know, in quarterbacks in the past. So shout out to the offensive line for being able to keep him up and keep him being able to get the ball to these guys. So it's just been really nice to see him kind of come come into his own and just really kind of own the offense and really kind of take over and become the leader of that offense. And so and this game on Sunday was just another example of how he's just been able to be that guy and be dominant on um, as a quarterback. All right, and Dan Campbell, listen, we talk about head coach of the year candidates, D'Amico Ryans from the Houston Texans, Kevin Stefanski from the Cleveland Browns. You can put Dan Campbell – from the Detroit Lions in the mix as well. Give me your thoughts on Coach Campbell and the improvement from last season to this season. Oh, for sure. So last season, you know, he he finished on such a high note, and I think that that was, you know, really what was able to kind of get the momentum going this year. And they were able to build on that. And you truly have seen and witnessed a change in culture. And, you know, I'm not sure what happened in the middle of last season that got them to turn the switch, but Campbell was able to do that, able to keep these guys together, able to kind of give them that grit, that mentality. And he's just been able to steer these guys 
even in the face of adversity last week in um, Dallas and just being able to answer the questions, answer the hard questions because, you know, as as he is, as we've all seen, he's got guts and he is willing to make risks and take, you know, make make some trick plays and some funky plays. And sometimes that does go awry, but he's still willing to stand in and take the questions and face the cons or face the fire, so to speak. But he's just been such a good leader and such so indicative of this, you know, Detroit grit blue collar kind of community and just he's taken that and just shown it and the players have truly bought in to his system and have really shown that they are you know that what they are and like I said we have witnessed a culture change in this team very quickly and I love it indeed not just you loving it as a Lions fan but all football fans are loving it as well and what a job he's done in such a short amount of time as the head coach of the Detroit Lions so the Detroit Lions beat the Minnesota Vikings in the final game in week 18 of the 2023-2024 NFL regular season 30 to 20. All right Sonia so the playoffs are here and it's been a minute since Lions fans have had a chance to watch a home playoff game. It's the first time since 1993 that the Detroit Lions will have a home playoff game. I got to ask you, what was the atmosphere like in 93 when the Lions had that their last home playoff game at the Pontiac Silverdome? <laughs> wow, Pontiac Silverdome. Yeah, that's that's how long it was. Um, so yeah, so in '93, I was like a wee little laugh. Okay, maybe not wee wee, but I was probably like 13 or 14, I think, when that happened. And um, I want to say that it was very like involved, and everybody was really excited and happy. But there was also just like. I don't know. I'm I'm probably remembering wrong because I wasn't like as into football then as I was now. But it was there was definitely excitement and definitely, you know, we had Barry Sanders, we had Wayne Fonts, we had, you know, all the guys. And um it was really there was excitement, but there was also because we kinda had been pretty decent in those past in those years in the early nineties. And so it was just kinda like, Yeah, we are here, we're solidified. I think what is happening now is kind of how they thought of the Lions or how people thought of the Lions back then is that they were this up-and-coming team and that things were going to be great and wonderful. And, you know, I think that they felt that this was going to be a, a, the start of something great. I think now we still have that same feeling. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that's kind of how it was. I think it was probably about the same. Well, definitely that crowd was definitely rocking, as you described it, in 93, and the crowd is definitely going to be rocking for 2024 with the Lions at that beautiful stadium in downtown Detroit at Ford Field. So we've got the Lions going up against the Rams. Two quarterbacks, just a little over three years ago, the trade happened. Matthew Stafford goes from the Motor City to the City of Angels. Jared Goff comes over to Detroit. Now, Sonia, a little over three years ago, Tom Brady made his return to Foxborough in an emotional game on Sunday night football against the New England Patriots when he was the quarterback of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Matthew Stafford still has a love for the city of Detroit so many seasons with the Lions, him and Calvin Johnson. The trade happened a few years ago. Do you expect somewhat of an emotional game, how Brady had his return to Foxborough. Do you expect Stafford to have that emotional return, Lions fans to have an emotional response with him coming back to Detroit? Um, As sweet as that sounds, I'm going to go ahead and say no. From what I've seen on the Twitters and the interwebs and the X's, (laughs) now Twitter, or former Twitter, now X, um, people while they tip their hat to Matthew Stafford, they realize that he is now an L.A. Ram and that he, you know, is the opponent and the Lions' job is to beat the Rams, including Matthew Stafford. And we thank him for his time in Detroit, but now he is a Ram and our quarterback is Jared Goff. And so that has really been 
um, the motivation, I think, but from the fans and the feeling from the fans is that Jared is our guy and, you know, you support Jared Goff. We are not – I won't say we are not supporting Matt Staff, Matthew Stafford because, you know, like I said, everybody still, I think, has a soft spot in their heart for him. But in this game right now, he is a Ram and Jared Goff is our quarterback, and that is the mentality that a lot of the fans have. I'm sure all the players have. Um, but, yeah, there's respect there. That's a good way of putting it. There is respect there for Matthew Stafford, but Jared Goff is the quarterback of the Lions, and that's who we are pulling for. <laughs> wow, very interesting right there. Okay, so no, uh, Brady. when Brady would return to Foxborough, there was definitely an, an emotional return, but as you, you described, it's going to be very different in the Motor City with the Rams and the Lions. All right, let's get to the keys to victory. So the L.A. Rams, their quarterback, Matthew Stafford, you knew about him for many seasons in Detroit, gets to L.A., wins the Super Bowl his first year as the quarterback. A lot of weapons with that Rams offense, such as Cooper Cup, also uh, their rookie running back, Kyron Williams. How about rookie wide receiver, Puka Nakua? What do you expect the keys to victory what do you think are going to be the keys to victory for the Lions' defense to stop the Rams' offense? It's going to be stopping Nakua. It's going to be stopping Cooper Cup. It's going to be making sure that those safeties are staying with them and, you know, making it difficult for Matthew Stafford. And Matthew Stafford has a beautiful arm and can make some really crazy throws and trick plays. But the secret is going to be trying to keep in front of them, keep in front of those receivers and really make it difficult for him. The Rams running game hasn't been as good. It's always been about those two receivers. And so just keeping an eye on them, making sure that they stay where they need to be, um, that the secondary is on top of them is going to be the biggest key, I think. Also keeping eyes on Matthew Stafford because, as we know in Detroit, he's tough, and that man will take off and run if he needs if he needs to. And so, just making sure that you are aware that Matthew Stafford can run, and the defense being able to stop that as well. Yeah, that's one thing about Stafford. You need like a Timex watch. Just takes a licking and kicks exactly. on ticking. And certainly, he certainly he did that for many seasons in Detroit, and he still. Tough and still durable with the Rams. Now let's switch over to the offensive side. Jared Goff, hey, the offense. Let's say Laporta does play. Let's say Sam Laporta does play. You've got Goff, you've got Laporta, you've got St. Brown, you've got the one-two punch of the running backs with Gibbs and Montgomery. On the defensive side, there's Aaron Donald, and he's still one of the best in the business. What do you think are going to be the keys to victory for the Lions' offense to get points against that Rams' defense? Um, Jared Goff working fast and Jared Goff getting to his receivers pretty quickly and the offensive line being able to stop Aaron Donald. I think that's probably going to be the biggest keys is just making sure that Aaron Donald is accounted for. This offensive line has been, you know, pretty stellar and has done a bang-up job this year um, and so just making sure that they keep an eye on Aaron Donald and the rest of their defense. I mean, it's their defense is nothing to really sneeze at, but they they have um, a very good defense. So just making sure that the line stays in t- or stays strong and then Jared, giving Jared off enough time to get to the receivers and get to his running backs and, you know, the offensive line creating those holes for those running backs as well. I think that's going to be the biggest thing. All right, solid. This is definitely going to be an interesting game with the Rams and the Lions. It's going to be a great one. And we talked about the last game, the last home playoff game the Lions had in 93 at the Pontiac Silverdome. What's the anticipation like for the Lions having a home playoff game at Ford Field? Because this is going to be the first one ever. So what's the anticipation going to be like? Oh, it's probably going to be nuts there. I mean, I think I just, I actually just saw a tweet that um, former um, safety Glover Quinn is going to be there, and that's going to be huge because Glover Quinn was such a really big part of um, some of those Lions teams a few years ago and kind of got chased off by Matt Patricia. So him being back I think is going to really add an extra kind of um, – 
Now that's a player that you can think of having an emotional return to Detroit because people really did love him. And I think that, you know, him coming back is going to be an emotional pick-me-up for the fans, for the team, just to kind of say welcome back because he hasn't really been back since Patricia has been, you know, around. Um, But now that he's gone, he's coming back for this, and so that's a huge event. Um, But it's just going to be insanity because, Lions fans are excited, and they've been excited all season that this is going to happen. And, um, you know, it's it's just going to be loud. It's going to be rocking. It's going to be so much fun and just insanity. So I hope the Rams are not ready for it. <laughs> the Los Angeles Rams and the Detroit Lions, according to the Elias Sports Bureau, the game between the Rams and the Lions will be the first matchup in NFL postseason history between starting quarterbacks who both are facing their former teams. So that's going to be interesting. We've got Jared Goff and Matthew Stafford. I take it there won't be any Adele tributes for uh, Stafford coming back to Detroit. I don't think so, huh? (laughs) No, there won't be hello from the other side. (laughs) Again, we respect Matthew. (laughs) We respect Matthew, and we are thankful for his time that he put in in Detroit. And we know that he and his family still like the city and appreciate the city, but that, you know, everybody is going to be supporting Jared Goff and, you know, making their feelings felt that Jared Goff is the quarterback and that's who we need to be um, supporting and rallying behind. There can only be one winner and there can only be one loser, and certainly one is going to have to fall, and it's going to be either the Los Angeles Rams or the Detroit Lions, but, hey, It's the first ever home playoff game at Ford Field in downtown Detroit between the L.A. Rams and the Detroit Lions as part of the Super Wild Card Weekend. And, uh, Sonia, again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us on the program. Tell everybody what's going on over at Our Turf Football. Oh, sure. So, yeah, first of all, again, as always, thank you for having me. Thank you for working me in. I really appreciate that. But over at our turf, we're having a great time. We are starting to branch out a little bit more into college football this season, and so expect more of that next season. You can find us on Twitter at our turf. FB. Um, we have a podcast once a week on Tuesdays at um, – 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central. You can find us over on YouTube and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, You can interact with us on our podcast. Um, And, you know, we'd love to have people doing that. So we're going to try. Hopefully we'll be able to get out to the NFL draft this year. So lots of big things coming up for our turf um, in the off season. So please make sure that you're following us at our turf FB on Twitter slash X. Um, and our YouTube channel is Our Turf Football. So, yep, make sure you head over there, like and subscribe, and that way you can interact with us on our podcast. Solid. One more time, Sonia. Tell everybody where they can find you on social media as well as Our Turf Football and any websites. Let the listeners know that as well. Oh, for sure. So you can find me on Twitter slash X. At mom, M O M, the number two, the number three, R N. Um, and then you can find me on Instagram at Sonia, S O N J A, 920. Um, you can find us over at our turf on Twitter at O U R O U R T U R F S B, our turf S B, um, on Twitter. And then over at, um, YouTube, it's our turf football. And then you can like and subscribe, and that way you can get to our podcast and be on it weekly with us because we love to interact with our um, viewers and guests. Awesome. You heard it from us. She is Sonia Greenfield, the Director of Writer Management, covering the NFC North for our turf football. Of course, giving us the full 411 for the Detroit Lions, her beloved Lions, as they get ready for the Super Wild Card Weekend in the playoff game against the Los Angeles Rams. As always, Sonia, again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. And if ever you want to come back on, feel free to let us know. Oh, for sure. You just let me know. I'm there. <laughs> All right, you got it. We'll be back with Boy right after this. Victor to Montgomery. Wide open LaPorta. Easy touchdown for the Lions. The key guy is a receiver here. Here's a toss. Here's Gibbs. Here's the corner and a touchdown. Yeah. 
There goes Skipper in motion. It's Montgomery. It is the Lions touchdown. Career high 13th of the year for Montgomery. Take to Jameer Gibbs. Deep throw from Goff. Down the sideline, St. Brown. Armand Ross St. Brown in a foot race. Eyes on the end zone. Cuts it back. St. Brown is all the way. Touchdown, Detroit. All right, now it's time to preview the games for Super Wild Card Weekend. The Cleveland Browns go up against the Houston Texans. So first for the Browns, they lost a meaningless game in week 18 to their in-state rival Cincinnati Bengals. Didn't matter. A lot of their starters didn't play. As for the Houston Texans, they had a big win in week 18 over the Indianapolis Colts to not only get a playoff spot, but also with the Jacksonville Jaguars losing their game. Houston wins the AFC South. So we set the stage for this big wildcard matchup down in H-Town in Houston with the Browns and the Texans. First for Cleveland, the quarterback, Joe Flacco. What an amazing story it's been for him this year. He's my hands down, my pick to win league's comeback player of the year. So you've got Flacco, you've got a great tight end with David and Joku. Amari Cooper is going to be ready for this game. You've got the one-two punch in the running back combination with Kareem Hunt and Jerome Ford. Defensively, guys like Miles Garrett, one of the best in the business. And as for the Texans, this is a big step up for them. D'Amico Ryans in his first year as the head coach of the Houston Texans has his team ready a solid defense, and they've got a quarterback who is definitely going to be the franchise guy for the next decade and a half in C.J. Stroud, who most likely I think he's going to be the hands-down favorite to win this year's Rookie of the Year. So we've got Cleveland and we've got Houston. This is going to be a fun game. I think it's going to be a high-scoring game. Defense is going to rule in the first half, but I think the second half we're going to see the quarterbacks come into full force or I should say the quarterbacks could take control in the second half not just with CJ Stroud but also you have an experienced Super Bowl winning quarterback in Joe Flacco so Cleveland and Houston this should be a good one we've got the Miami Dolphins going up against the Kansas City Chiefs for Miami they lost a tough game in week 18 to the Buffalo Bills. Not only did they, with losing the game, not only did they lose a chance to win the AFC East division title, but also they dropped down in seeding, which means they took, uh, with them dropping in seeding, they have to travel on the road on the wild card game and had and head to a tough and very bone chilling Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City to take on the Chiefs and the Game time temperature is expected to be right at zero. So, yes, folks, not double digits, single digits. And there's been a lot of talk about the Dolphins and are they going to be mentally prepared for this game? Are they going to be have the mental fortitude to come in in a game where the temperature is expected to be in single digits? I don't know about Miami, but I know Kansas City appears to be ready for this one. Kansas City, they lost, um, excuse me, they won their final game of the regular season in week 18, beating the loss, beating the Los Angeles Chargers. I mean, it was a meaningless game because a lot of their guys didn't play, but Mahomes is going to be ready. Kelsey's going to be ready. And everything is in their favor right now. Everything is, the momentum seems to be swinging in favor of Kansas City. They've got home field advantage they've got the home playoff game the weather is 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 expected to be bone chilling is expected to be be uh, below freezing that wind chill is expected to be no joke at arrowhead stadium but if you know about one of the most diehard one of the most sincere fan bases in the nfl being the kansas city chiefs you know their fans show up and show out at any given time so this should be an intriguing matchup, an interesting matchup with the Dolphins and the Chiefs. How's Tua going to be able to throw the ball? We know Miami's offense all year has been built for speed. We know about not just Tua Tagovailoa, but about Tyreek Hill and that running game. That offense has been built for speed. Will they have the speed? Will they have the endurance to endure the frigid temperatures at Arrowhead? Should be interesting with the Miami Dolphins going up against the Kansas City Chiefs. 
the Pittsburgh Steelers go up against the Buffalo Bills. For, so for the Steelers in Week 18's matchup, they had a tough game, but they were able to beat the Baltimore Ravens, and they got help along the way to help them clinch a playoff spot. So Pittsburgh in the wild card game, they'll head to Western New York to take on the Buffalo Bills. Buffalo big win over the Miami Dolphins, and now the Bills get the number two seed and they get a home playoff game. So for the Steelers, tough break for them. They wind up losing TJ Watt due to a knee injury that is devastating because that's really not just a huge piece of not just their defense, but that's the heart and soul of their team. So the Steelers are going to have to rely on Mason Rudolph, and they're also going to have to rely heavily on the running game with Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. As for Buffalo, listen, we talked about Kansas City and their fan base being one of the best in the NFL. Buffalo, they're right up there with Arrowhead, and at that stadium at Orchard Park is going to be rocking, and they have a lot to be excited about. Josh Allen, Stephon Diggs, James Cook, the Buffalo Bills, they are they have been hot, and they got hot at the right time. This is going to be an interesting game. I think Buffalo is going to take full control of this game and those fans up in Western New York in Western New York at Orchard Park are certainly going to be in for a treat as the Pittsburgh Steelers take on the Buffalo Bills. We've got the Dallas Cowboys going up against the Green Bay Packers. So Cowboys Packers, hey, it's about as American as apple pie, right? You've got one team that plays in a big city in Dallas and you've got one team that plays in the smallest market in the National Football League. Green Bay may be a small town, but it's big time football and they've been producing it for so long. And, you know, what a difference a year makes for the Green Bay Packers. Last year, Aaron Rodgers was the starting quarterback. They had a chance to get into the playoffs. They would lose to the emerging Detroit Lions. This year, the Packers beat the Chicago Bears in week 18. They earned their playoff spot. And Jordan Love a lot of people doubted Jordan Love right at the middle of October, or really late October, right around Halloween. People were saying, is Jordan Love the one that can get it done? Is he the guy that can take the Packers and take them to the next level after we saw Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers? Well, in his first year as the starter, he's made that happen. And then some, but not just with Jordan Love, but also with Aaron Jones, also with A.J. Dillon. A solid receiving core. And defense has been solid as well. So Green Bay in the playoffs, the Dallas Cowboys, every year is a pressure year for them. When is it not a Super Bowl year for them every year, right? Listen, Dak Prescott, MVP candidate, C.D. Lamb, him and Dak are probably hot, if not the hot, one of the hottest quarterback receiver tandems in the league. Tony Pollard's been decent. Uh, Jake Ferguson is a nice tight end for them. And on the defensive side, Deron Bland. Also, Micah Parsons being Micah Parsons, right? So the Cowboys and the Packers, they're going to be playing at Jerry World at AT AT&T Stadium in Arlington. You know about the Cowboys-Packers rivalry. It's been fun for many decades, and this game should be exciting. The Los Angeles Rams go up against the Detroit Lions. So several years ago, both of these teams made a trade where both quarterbacks switched scenery. Matthew Stafford heads from Detroit to L.A. Jared Goff heads from L.A. to Detroit. And Stafford's first year with the Rams, they win the Super Bowl. As for Goff's first year in Detroit, had to go through the growing pains. Last year was the year where they really got over the hump and beat the Green Bay Packers, and they became an an emerging team. And you talk about what a difference a year makes. Last year, they didn't make the playoffs, but the future was bright for the Lions. This year, they're in the playoffs. They host a wild card game. And this is going to be the first time since 1993 that the Lions will host a home playoff game. And the people in Detroit are excited about this. And they're also excited to see Matthew Stafford make his first return to Detroit since being traded from the Lions. And I don't know if this is going to be a uh, sentimental matchup. I don't know if this is going to have an an emotional thing, but I know one thing's for sure. Rams and Lions, both of these teams have high-powered offenses, Stafford and Goff, but also for the Lions. 
Sam Laporta, Amon Ross St. Brown, Jameer Gibbs, David Montgomery. Also, you've got four of the Rams, Puka Nakua, Cooper Cup, Kyron Williams, just to name a few. Defensively, Detroit is solid. For the Rams, they've got Aaron Donald. Never sleep on him. It's going to be a great matchup in the Motor City in Detroit. Going to be a fun one between the L.A. Rams and the Detroit Lions. We have the Philadelphia Eagles going up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. For the Eagles, you talk about a fall from grace. What a difference a year makes, but not in the not in the right way. The Eagles have fallen very hard. Injuries have hit them. Coaching changes happen during the offseason, and you really see it in their play. But the Eagles are in the playoffs. They have to travel for this wild card game, and they're going up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. For the Eagles, Jalen Hurts, listen, Jalen is about as one of the toughest players in the league. You know he's going to play, try to play up to his best. A.J. Brown battling a knee injury, you know he's tough. You know he's going to try to bring his best. Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard, uh, DeAndre Swift. Offensively, Philly's going to have to bring it, and their offensive line is going to have to bring it as well. For Tampa Bay, Baker Mayfield, we talk about Joe Flacco. Listen, Baker deserves a strong consideration for comeback player of the year. Rashad White has had a nice year for Tampa Bay, not just running, but also catching the ball out of the backfield as well. Defensively, Tampa, very strong. They're going to have to be strong in this game because the Eagles, if you don't play them tight, Jalen Hurts could have a field day with you as well as this Eagles offense as well. So the Eagles and the Buccaneers, should be an interesting one. I think it's going to come down to maybe one mistake and it could end in a possible field goal. Perhaps I think Jalen hurts. Yeah. The Eagles are banged up. It's a different year for them. It's just not the same team, but it could come down to one, maybe two turnovers and a team getting in field goal range and winning the game. Now it's time for my game of the week. My game of the week is going to be the Green Bay Packers going up against the Dallas Cowboys. So many iconic players, so many iconic games as a part of this rivalry. The Ice Bowl, yeah, the 1967 NFL championship game where Bart Starr did the quarterback sneak, got into the end zone for the touchdown. And by the way, that temperature was negative 13. Also, remember at Lambeau Field, Tony Romo, Completing a pass to Des Bryant. Did he catch it? Did he not catch it? Hey, the referee said that he did not complete the act of making the catch, right? So many great memories that have come out of this, right? Aaron Rodgers coming in, making a key, an awesome throw to Jared Cook. Setting up Mason Crosby to kick the game-winning field goal. So many great moments, so many great players in this rivalry. Bart Starr, Jerry Kramer, Don Meredith, Roger Staubach, Tony Romo, Des Bryant, Aaron Rodgers, Brett Favre, Reggie White. I mean, hey, Troy Aikman, Emmitt Smith, the list goes on and on. Michael Irvin. Hey, I think this game is going to continue to be in the history of this awesome rivalry. We've got Dak Prescott. This is a pressure field year for him. When is it not a pressure field year for the Dallas Cowboys? Every year is Super Bowl or bust. You've got C.D. Lamb, who is developing into one of the premier receivers in the league. Jake Ferguson, solid tight end. You've got on the defensive side, Michael Parsons, who's a, a man amongst boys. And then also you've got the Green Bay Packers. What a year. It has been for Jordan Love. This is his first year as a starting quarterback. The Packers were counted out right after the end of October. By Thanksgiving, hey, after beating the Detroit Lions, people considered them to be legitimate, and they continued to get better and better week after week. And I think this game is going to continue to show just how great both of these franchises are and meta yet how great these franchises have been for so long. This rivalry has and continues to provide the drama, and I think this is going to provide a lot of drama for this game. Their first meeting between these two teams was November the 13th, 1960. The Packers beat the Cowboys 41-7. 
The last time these two teams met was November 13, 2022. Packers beat the Cowboys in overtime 31 to 28. So this is going to be one, I think is going to be one heck of a game. Cowboys, Packers, hey, these this is about as American as apple pie, right? I mentioned the names. I mentioned some of the games that these two teams have just been involved in with some crazy storylines, crazy situations. And hey, the best the best has been has been provided and the best is still yet to come in this rivalry. The Green Bay Packers versus the Dallas Cowboys, my game of the week. All right, before we get on out of here, I want to give you my picks on who I think will win Super Wild Card Weekend's playoff games. The Cleveland Browns square off against the Houston Texans. I like Cleveland to win. The Miami Dolphins square off against the Kansas City Chiefs. I like Kansas City to win. The Pittsburgh Steelers square off against the Buffalo Bills. I like Buffalo to win. The Green Bay Packers go up against the Dallas Cowboys. I like Green Bay to win. The Los Angeles Rams versus the Detroit Lions. I like the Rams to win. The Philadelphia Eagles go up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I like Philadelphia to win. So again, my picks are Cleveland, Kansas City, Buffalo, Green Bay, LA Rams, Philadelphia. And there you have it. That's going to do it for another exciting edition of the League Wraparound. I'd like to thank you out there, the listeners, for tuning in to another exciting show. Thank you so much for your support, as always. And until next time, everybody, I'm at Robinson saying so long, and you take care. <laughs>